that track when he writes this letter to them. This letter that is addressed by this time many controversies in that church. Thank God, by God's grace, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He didn't, he didn't remove the name. He didn't say you've, you've forfeited the right to be identified as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he addresses some problems. When we come to today, we're looking for the third time at this notion of that Christian love shapes the Christian life. A hateful Christian is an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms, just really kind of like jumbo shrimp. Jumbo shrimp, you ever thought about that? Shrimp, jumbo, jumbo shrimp. No, it's, not, it's an oxymoron. There are others that I won't cite today, but, but a hateful Christian is an impossibility. A Christian who has been the receiving, on the receiving end of the love of God, loves, imperfectly albeit, failingly to be sure, but love works itself out. And so, so Paul is, is using that word to correct abuses in Corinth concerning the spiritual gifts. We've gone through that, chapter 12. If you didn't get to hear that, you can go to, uh, where is that, Michelle? Sermon Audio and, and YouTube, I think we've got those on there. But today, 1 Corinthians 13, if you want to stand with me, I want to read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 13. We will, God helping us, carve out verses 4 to 7 today. Having looked last week at the necessity of love, looking today at, the, at how excellent love is. Follow along as I read from the English Standard Version, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child... I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. What have we read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may, may we not be like the Corinthians, knowing about these things, but not, but not praying and, and, and meditating upon them and studying in the Word so that they, that they take us over and work out from us. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that, and we've, we've referenced this before through the years, that you hear this read a lot at weddings, and it should be read at weddings because... If a marriage is going to survive, this has got to be driving it. Uh, this needs to, to be at the forefront. Uh, I also told you that there are three words operating in the Greek language. Two of them appear in the New Testament. The one that does not is the word eros. We mentioned that last week. It's, it's, uh, we get our word erotic from that. That's, uh, it normally carries itself off into a very bad place. Uh, we told you to, to help understand and hang, a, hang a, an idea on these. Eros says, I love you if, uh, if you do certain things. You meet certain conditions, I love you. Uh, philia, or phileo, oh, this, that love is a friendship love. The word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, comes right out of this word. Uh, phileo adelphos, it's uh, in the Greek love or friendship love of brother, brotherly love. And then the third, agape, that's our word here. 
In fact, I think it's the King James that speaks of it as charity. uses the word charity in the King James uh, to set it apart from, from uh, different misunderstandings of love. The word agape was taken by Jesus and transformed in terms of how he used it and how he showed it uh, in, the, uh, in John 13 as he's coming close to the end. You know, remember John's gospel, remember beginning in chapter 13, gives us this whole body of material of Jesus in the upper room and teaching his disciples that we don't have anywhere else in the gospels. So in John 13, it begins that having, having loved his own who were in the world, having agape his own who were in the world, he now was going to demonstrate the full extent of his agape. And of course, that's where he washes their feet. He stoops down as a servant. The Messiah, the Son of God, the, uh, the eternal Son of God, the, the uh, creator of heaven and earth, he washes their feet, even though he's about to be tortured. And so he shows agape love. Jesus transformed this. And so we told you that, that this passage is broken down into three uh, sections. The necessity of love, we looked at that last week, verses 1 to 3. The excellence of love, which we're going to look at today. And then the perpetuity, the, how it continues uh, of love and what that, what that looks like. Um, when we get to verse 4 to 7, I want to read that again just to keep this in your mind. This, there's 15, uh, some would say descriptions, I think Dr. Curtis Vaughn in his commentary says depictions. Someone else said prescriptions. It's, it's, like, it's like you've been written a prescription. See, I, I, don't, I don't love like I ought to love. Let me write you a prescription for that. And this, these 15 things would be on it if you had that. So here's, here's what it looks like. <clears throat> I want you to learn some things about this. When you read this, first of all, it should strike you that Jesus Christ is this. When you look at the life of Christ, this is what you see. Secondly, when you look in a mirror, you don't always see this. And then when you undertake, when you take it seriously, say, okay, all right. I've had couples, I've been doing premarital counseling now for more than 40 years. I've had couples say, well, all right, that's us. And then they break up. Down the road, one leaves the other. Well, clearly, this cannot be driving the relationship if it comes to an end. Because the word in verse 8 that we may or may not get to today says love never ends. Our love keeps on loving. And so it, we look in the mirror, we don't see this. And I'm going to tell you here, with all the love I can muster, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this will increasingly work itself out in your life. In other words, the older one gets, barring uh, dementia, obviously, the older one gets, the more this ought to manifest itself. And I see this, by the way. I get, I get to see this as I sit down and visit with elderly Christians who exude and demonstrate more of the love of Christ as they go. And the, and the Gaither, uh, Alleluia, that great uh, piece that they wrote, that whole group of songs, cantata, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. You know what happens to people who will say the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows? They grow sweeter. <laughs> you show me a Christian who's not growing sweeter, I would submit to you that they're not, they're not experiencing the increasing sweetness of Jesus because that's the way it is in the Christian life. And then if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet here, I'm going to give this to you, and you're responsible under God to grab it and run with it, but you're, going to, you're not going to keep up. You won't, you won't continue. You can't. You see, this, is, this agape love is only found in the heart of people who have been saved by grace through faith. And not a few people who have been saved by grace struggle in these areas. So if you struggle today, welcome, friend. <laughs> we struggle, all right? So let's look at this. Let's see this, this excellence of love, verses 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. A depiction of love in 15 ways. Now, when you see this where this is in in the Corinthian letter, there's an implied contrast here. In fact, some of the commentators that you read will say, "This, this is a challenging passage because unlike much of Paul's writing, it does not fall out in some sort of logical, sequential way. He's uh, it, it's re- that's why I just, I just go with the 15. There's, there's no way really to categorize them. And, it, and you, you get the sense that when Paul writes this, he is responding to what he has heard is going on in Corinth. And under the inspiration of the Spirit, he is, he is writing a rebuttal to that. He is writing, this is what should take its place. So let's read it that way. As if you or a member of the Corinthian church where there are people who are fussing and fighting over spiritual gifts, the charismata, and who are abusing them or neglecting them, and it's causing tension in the church. And then as we do that, remember, just apply it to yourself. Remember Jesus Christ. Say, oh God, oh, to be like you. (laughs) Oh, to be like you. Help us, Lord. More love, Lord. More love. First of all, love is patient. The word here would literally mean it, it, it is long to burn. <laughs> In other words, it, doesn't, it has a long fuse. Uh, some people have short fuses. Some people are like, are like firecrackers. You light it. What, if you've ever played with firecrackers, what happens? Think about this. You light it. Have you ever held one a little longer than you should? If there are people around you, what do they do? Throw it, throw it, throw it. Why? Because they know what's coming. Boom. That's not the, this, this is the opposite of that word. This is the opposite of that word. It's patient. You see, there are two, basically two types of people in terms of how they, people who are, who are volcanoes, Full confession, if the Spirit of God did not harness me down, that's, that's kind of my demeanor. I, I erupt. All right. But there are the seethers, S-E-E-T-H-E-R-S. They, they don't erupt. They just seethe. They build. And then when you least expect it, it comes out. It comes out. You know people like this. You may struggle with one of those two. See, love is not that. Love is patient. It's long-tempered. It doesn't quickly take offense. It doesn't quickly want to get even. You, you've, seen, you've seen the bumper sticker, I don't get mad, I get even. That's the opposite of this. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, this culture says vengeance is mine. <laughs> God can do what he wants to. No. Love checks that. Think about that in Corinth. The impatience was being expressed. And and when he picks up these other words, you're going to get a profile, really, of what was happening in the Corinthian church based on what Paul says love is and is not, what love does and does not do. Secondly, love is kind. This is a word that, it's, it's interesting, This Greek word is found only in Christian writings. You don't find it's one of those words that was sort of made up for that that worldview. You don't find it outside Christian writings. Loving, merciful, that's the word there. Love is merciful. Remember the story. We've we've studied it. We've we've referenced it. Man is dragged before the king. Jesus teaches this in the Gospels. He owes him, in our, in our terms, $5 million. Pay me all you owe me, he says. Well, he says, have mercy on me. I can't, I can't do that. But have mercy. I, I will pay it out. Well, there's no way the man was going to pay that out. But the, the king has, has pity on him, and he forgives him the entire debt. Cancel, $5 million debt. Right? He walks out of there, and he 
bumps into a man on the road who owed him $5 in the, in the exchange, the equivalent exchange, $5. He grabs him around the throat. He says, pay me what you owe me. It's interesting when you study this in the Greek, the man said exactly the same thing to him as the, as the, as the fellow with his hands around the guy's throat had said to the king. Pay me what you, have mercy on me and I, I will pay it off. No, throw this one into debtor's prison, which was his right, his prerogative if he was not being paid in a timely way. Then the man would go to debtor's prison. Debtor's prison is where you work all day, you go back to jail at night, away from your family, and, and you don't get, your family doesn't get any wages until you've paid off the debt. Well, the king hears about this, and he, he summons him back. He said, did you do this? Is it true? I forgave you all this debt, and you, you had a man thrown into debtor's prison who owed you $5? And then he says, come take this one away. Interesting if you know the story. He doesn't say, hand him over to debtor's prison, which the fellow would never have gotten out of, by the way. He says, hand this one over to tormentors, different kind of prison. This is where you work all day and you're tortured at night. Not a very long life expectancy in that place. And then Jesus, so he tells this story and he says, and so will my heavenly father do to every one of you if you do not show mercy to those who owe you. See, love is kind, it's merciful. Because it's patient. It's a disposition. Love does good to those who do harm. Apply that. Apply that to Corinth. The friction that was going on there in so many different ways before we got to chapter 12. See, if kindness is, is it putting his first foot forward, in Corinth, a lot of these things are checked because, you know, it takes two to fight, right? Love is kind. Apply that in your life. Apply that in a church. What would a church look like if everyone committed under God, I confess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit is living in me because that's what it means to be a Christian is the Holy Spirit to come and take residence there. Lord, cultivate in me patience. Cultivate in me kindness. So-and-so was unkind to me. All right, you got an option there. It becomes an opportunity to respond mercifully <laughs> or to act like the rest of the world. Third, love does not envy. Uh, of the, one of the commentators says, love does not boil with jealousy. Do you boil? Boiling is a little different than seething. Seething is under the surface. You can watch a pot turn, put water in it, turn up the heat. It's going to start bubbling, going to start boiling. It doesn't boil. Stir up wrong feelings toward people. So agape, agape stops that. Agape checks that. Agape applied intentionally, regularly, preemptively, keeps boiling from happening, envying. You see it all the time. We live in a culture of envy. The Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice. The culture says if somebody's got something you don't have, that's not right. They shouldn't have it. That's not a biblical concept. Biblical concept. I told you about a church I knew about years ago, when, and I knew some of the folks in it, and they would, they would be afraid to, to share that they might have gotten new furniture because they didn't know what the leadership would think about. They would look and go, hmm, well, if you can afford new furniture, that's awful. Love rejoices. Love does not envy. Love thanks God. Love blesses God. The devil is whispering all the time saying, well, why do they have that? You don't. Why'd they get that? You didn't. Why were they recognized for that? Nobody recognizes you. The envy, the jealousy, the so-called green-eyed 
monster. Love does not do that, so agape love applied checks that. By the way, when you find yourself envious, when you find yourself envious, get before God and say, Lord, I need, I need a fresh anointing of agape love on me. I need it to check this stuff growing in me that I don't, I don't like. Fourth, love does not boast. Uh, it's not uh, pay attention to me, 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 me. Me. It's, it's the, it's the fellow in the conversation when someone's sharing something and the fellow goes, oh yeah, well, that's nothing. <laughs> I was with some pastors one time <laughs> and he was telling a story about, it was, it was an African-American pastor and he's about a, in a group of guys who were strutting around and he said, well, he said, I once cut off the tail of a lion. And the guys looked at him and said, you did what? Well, yeah, like with a pen knife. Well, they stopped him and he said, of course he was dead, but still. You don't, you don't put yourself forward. I, I, I mean, you know, the, the guy we say his eyes are too close together. Well, I this and I that and me and, and mine. By the way, did I tell you that I, no. The Christian in denying himself, this is the, this is the opposite of self-denial, is talking about him, he, <laughs> Jesus. He makes much of Jesus. Paul's concerned that's not happening in, in Corinth. You can imagine people abusing the spiritual gifts in Corinth, particularly the gift of tongues, which he's going to boil it down to when we get to chapter 14. He's going to go after that. That Well, well yes, I was, I was speaking in tongues the other day. And I... no. no. Paul will have none of it. He doesn't boast. He doesn't play the braggart. It, one, one writer, one commentator said, it makes no parade. Fifth, it's not arrogant. Now, it's interesting. You have a subtle difference here. Boasting is a verb. Arrogance is a noun. So he, he here combines the idea of acting on something, of how you conduct yourself, and then how you think. It's not arrogant. Listen to how Paul uses this word in 1 Corinthians earlier. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, in order that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written so that none of you may be, and there's the word, puffed up in favor of one against another. You see how it was working itself out in, in Corinth? Well, I don't think my friend so-and-so gets enough credit. I think so-and-so over there way too much credit. That's, that's how it was ha happening in Corinth. Puffed up. 1 Corinthians 4, 18 and 19. Some are arrogant. He uses the word here. As though I were not coming to you. There was that, that problem where people were talking about Paul sort of behind his back or in his absence about, you know, Paul's a, he's, he, he talks big. He doesn't do anything. And he says, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant, he uses it twice here, arrogant people, but their power. I want to see what, what is it that they're flexing because they're talking pretty, pretty cheesy here, boastful. Then 1 Corinthians 5, 2, with the, the guy who was, who was carrying on with immorality in, in the congregation, Paul uses it again. And you were arrogant. They were boasting about how loving, this is, this is the irony, about how loving they were, about how tolerant they were. Yeah, yeah, guy is... We, we do, we have heard he's sleeping with his stepmother, but you know, I mean... We're under grace, Paul says. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Then 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know, and remember here he's quoting them, we know that all of us possess knowledge. That's what, that's what they were saying. That's what they were acting. Well, you know, we're... We're Christians. We, we know some things the rest of the world doesn't know. And, and, and there are those of us in this congregation who know some things that others in the congregation don't know. He says this so-called knowledge puffs up. Same word. And notice what he contrasts it with. But love builds up. So you check yourself. Am I building me up or am I building others up? 
Building me up, arrogance. Building others up, agape, love. And then verse 6, or the six, verse 5, the sixth one, love is not rude. It's a little different than the word that we use here. It doesn't treat others unfairly. It wants to uh, esteem others better than ourselves, as the Scripture teaches. One writer says it's never. The emphasis there is it's never rude. It's tactful. You ever known somebody that has no tact? I've known people like this. Well, that's just the way I am. You don't like it? Well, uh, gee, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> I, thought, I thought for a Christian, unsanctified character traits were supposed to be being mortified, nailed to the cross, put to death. Paul says, such were some of you, but you were washed. That's 1 Corinthians 6. And so this... This notion of, of a rudeness. There's, there's nothing. I, read, I knew a fellow years ago, was decades ago now, counseling him, and he read a book called The Angry Book. And The Angry Book basically said, look, don't be a hypocrite. Don't pretend you feel a certain way. Just be, be honest with your feelings. Well, it was a license. It was a license to offend. And I said, you know, no one's calling upon you to be a hypocrite. But you are called upon, if you profess to be a Christian, to act like a Christian, <laughs> to be kind, to be charitable, to think the best. And he would just say, well, I just got to be honest, I don't like you. Where, where, where in the Bible is a Christian given the privilege of saying, I don't like you? When Jesus says, love your enemies. Who, who are we speaking to that we can say, I don't like, if, if Jesus says, love your enemies. I mean, what category is this person in? No, it's not rude. Seven, it does not insist on its own way. My way or the highway. You've known people like this. Everything's fine until they don't get their way. And what do they do? They take their marbles and they go home. You see, agape says, okay, didn't go your way. Here's an opportunity for you to show that your love is unconditional. It's one, of the, it's one of the pictures of agape love. Eros love says, I love you is, if. Phileo love says, I love you because. Agape love says, I love you. I love you. And see, this is not agape that insists on its own way. It's interesting how people couch that. Well, he doesn't listen. How long did he spend with you? Well, I don't know, about an hour. Was he reading something the whole time? No. Okay. So, so the definition of he doesn't listen means he doesn't do what I want. But agape doesn't operate that way. Agape insists on what? Here's, here's, the, here's the agape Jesus Christ being Lord of my life, Lord of my family. Lord of the church, and laboring and living until the day when Jesus Christ is obviously demonstrated and acknowledged as King of kings and Lord of lords over all the earth. It doesn't have to be my way at home or in the church. It needs to be Jesus' way. And if we're striving to find Jesus' way, acknowledge him as head, it's amazing what goes away in the sense of Attention. He doesn't insist on its own way. Eighth, it's not irritable. It's not touchy. Doesn't you depict people who carry their feelings around on their shoulder? Just daring you to knock them off. Daring you to do something to offend them. I told you before when I was back when I was 20, struggling with Perhaps God was calling me into the ministry. An older minister said to me, he said, son, if you're going to go into the ministry, if that's what God has for you, you better have the heart of Lottie Moon and the height of a rhinoceros. This is not the place to uh, keep your feelings on your shoulder. And boy, what do we live in today? I'm going to tell you something. Members, guests, we haven't designated safe spaces in this facility, but I will offer you the safe space, and that is Jesus Christ, the Lord. 
They don't call the life we're living now heaven for one big reason. It's not heaven. One day we'll be in heaven, God willing. But this, this notion of I'm offended, I'm offended, I'm offended, you've offended me. Well, that's, that's the language of the world. It's not the language of the church. It's not the language of followers of Christ. It's not quick to take offense. It doesn't get embittered by injury. You've been hurt by somebody? Don't show no. Been hurt by somebody? Welcome to life. But guess what? You live for a Savior who died for you, who was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, called a demon by his stepbrothers. Shall I go on? Called a demon by the religious leaders of the day. We're studying a letter written by a man who wrote half the New Testament who would say at one point, no one continues to follow me except... Think of the people he lost. Paul lost a lot of companions who began serving and fell away. No, one writer said, the troubles we have in this world, to take away the self-inflicted ones now, the ones we bring on ourselves, the troubles we have in this world are designed by God to keep us from ever becoming too comfortable in this world and remembering we're not made for this world we're on to a better one, a dwelling not made with hands in the heavens. Difficulty. So, the, so this notion today that I should be able to live without anyone offending me, without anyone, any difficulty, is, is a lie out of the pit of hell designed to drive people to utter despair and to divide men and women, boys and girls, made in the image of God. That's what it's about. And see, love doesn't play that game. Agape love doesn't buy that. Nine, it's not resentful. Here, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Doesn't keep a record of wrongs. This is one of the, this is one of the things that undoes so many marriages. It's subtle. I tried to teach couples through the years that you, you need to keep your conversations, uh, you need to keep it clean in terms of, of no resentment. That's why the scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed. If you've got an issue, work with it. Use gospel means to, uh, to bring it to reconciliation. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is a, is a ministry of reconciliation, a message of reconciliation. And Jesus came to reconcile. All right? And so when that's not happening, guess what is happening? The devil's saying, that's, that's okay. That's not, just put that over here in the stockpile. And it starts piling up. And it piling up. And then one day, the least little thing sets off this nuclear barrage. <laughs> and you think, where did that come from? It came from a whole pile of unresolved issues. See, agape doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I had a fellow say to me years ago before I got here, we were talking one time, and he just all of a sudden he said, well, I'll tell you what I'm offended about. I said, what? He said, and he literally pulled out, he said, on such and such a date, we had you and your wife over for coffee. On such and such a date, we asked you over to eat. On such and such a date, we've invited us to go out. And he said, and you haven't asked us over. I said, well, I, you know, I would, I'd love to have known you were keeping score. If I'd known you were keeping score, then I would have tried to keep up. Doesn't keep a record of wrong. Let me tell you something. Today, if you're harboring in your heart wrong that somebody has done to you, let me tell you, for the good of your own soul, do you know what grows in a heart that harbors resentment? Weeds of bitterness. Weeds of bitterness. For your own soul, forgive that person. Let it go. Let it go. See, agape doesn't do that. Agape doesn't want to see people experience a bad end because these people hurt us. 
Agape realizes that Jesus Christ never committed one sin, and yet he bore the wrath of God for my sin. And that reminder keeps me from cultivating resentfulness. Well, we're in verse 6, number 10, and we need to stop. And God willing, we'll come back next Sunday morning and see 10 through 15 and see how they, the list just keeps going. You see what Paul's doing here? This is fascinating. He's, he is, you can imagine he's writing or he's, having some, he's dictating to somebody. Someone's writing for him. He's maybe reading the, the letter that came to him, reflecting upon it. Like, that's just, he's basically saying, I know, I know this is happening in Corinth, but agape doesn't do that. Agape doesn't bear resentment. Agape doesn't uh, have touchy feelings. Look to, to dominate people. I don't have time to develop this, but you know, the people who are easily offended, it is a manipulative technique to control. Just think about it. It's how they control the situation. Doesn't insist on its own way. It's not rude. It's not arrogant. It's not boastful. It's not envious. It's kind. It's patient. Can you imagine what would a household be that is driven by these things? What would a church be that is driven by these things? We need to, we need to engage. Repent where we need to repent. Thank God that Jesus Christ is all of this to us and more. And ask for grace to become more reflective of these things. That the love of Christ will dwell in us, as Paul says to the Ephesians and the Colossians. Dwell in us. And as it dwells and it abides, it spills over. And when people bump into us or take a swing at us, that what comes out is agape. The power of that is incredible. Do you know him today? You read, maybe you're reading this saying, wow, I don't see that in me at all. Well, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't judge your heart. But could it be that because Christ is not there? Because Christ is not there? Do you know him? The one who loved you and gave himself for you? Gave you the Holy Spirit to be like him? I pray that you do. If you don't, we're here to help. If you do and you say, I'm struggling, Pastor, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> You're among fellow strugglers. Main thing is there's a struggle. That we haven't made peace with any of these things that are contrary to agape. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we read this passage today, and Lord, honestly, I see there are things, I, as this mirror is held up to me, there are things I see that I don't like about me. I, oh, God, wash me thoroughly with your word. Cleanse me from these um, remaining sins. And I pray that your spirit will give me the grace that we will replace these different expressions with agape expressions. Help us to be more like Christ. Help us as a church to take this to heart, realizing that your Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write this to a church. <clears throat> and may we take this so seriously that in our lives and in this place, agape blooms and blossoms and spreads like ground cover. to make an impact on our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, our enemies, this community, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.